Once again, I'd like to welcome everybody to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. This month's webinar is on wetland management. It's presented by Dr. Bart Ballard with the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. <laughs> this month's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Dr. Ballard, pass the controls over to you and you should be good to go. All right. Thanks, Clint. Thank you for that introduction. I'm glad to, I'm glad to be part of your webinar series, and I hope this one is at least helpful to some of your viewers. Um, I wasn't quite sure about, you know, the type of audience to expect, so I'm going to start out with just some basic wetland ecology to make sure we're kind of all on the same page and, and to understand the, kind of the whys behind the, some of the management considerations. Get this thing to work here. Okay. So, yeah, let's start out by looking at a, a definition of a wetland. This is the this is a definition, or at least the first part of the definition of the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wetland definition, and and it states that wetlands are lands transitional between terrestrial and aquatic systems where the water table is usually at or near the surface, or the land is covered by shallow water. And, and the important aspect of this definition is that it lands that is that wetlands are transitional between terrestrial and, and fully aquatic systems. Thus, wetlands are not necessarily wet all the time, and this is a kind of a common misconception among many people I talk with and many of the landowners that you know that I that I deal with. So, so if you think about them as as this transitional habitat, their degree of wetness can can range anywhere from you know from moist soil areas that are they're only wet for a short period of time, to, you know during the growing season, to to more you know permanently flooded um, wetlands that can be somewhat similar to fully. Uh, fully aquatic deep water system that kind of shows you a range there in that, that little schematic that I, that I drew in the bottom of the screen. So another part of the definition, uh, the fish and wildlife definition, is, is that it has to include all these three characteristics. And I've kind of paraphrased here a bit to, to simplify things, but, but the presence of water is an obvious feature of wetlands, um, and water during the growing season, whether it's a saturated soil or a, or a flooded condition you know, above the water, is, is the main influence that produces these, these unique soil systems, and we call these hydric soils. Um, and it limits plant growth to those species. These soil conditions, these unique conditions, uh, limits plant growth to only those species that are adapted to these saturated or flooded conditions. So the influence of water on the soil during the growing season has many effects on the properties of the soil environment, which, which we're not really going to go through here because it gets pretty detailed, but, but the main, kind of the main take home message is, is that it causes anaerobic soil conditions or, or the lack of oxygen in the soil that inhibits many plants from growing. And all plants need oxygen at their roots to, for metabolic processes. So if we look at a, a, tr a typical terrestrial soil, where oxygen is not limited, you know, the pore spaces, which we can see here in this little schematic, um, in the soil keep the, keep the plant roots in contact with atmospheric oxygen. And so oxygen moves freely between, between the airspace above the soil and the plant roots. When we add water onto the soil, it, it covers the soil and, and the connection really between the atmosphere and the, and the roots for all practical purposes is cut off. Um, and Terrestrial plants, in fact, will die relatively qu quickly in these conditions because of the lack of oxygen. So, so the there is still a bit of oxygen that comes down to the surface of the soil. You can see those little arrows there. There's a there's typically a film on top of the soil that'll be will remain oxygenated for a while, and that's why we see a lot of plants with kind of these laterally growing roots. They take advantage of of that soil at the surface. That's one of their adaptations. So wetland plants, on the other hand, are are able to tolerate this. They, they have adaptations uh, and they've adapted many ways to transport oxygen to their roots. Um, some of them are, are relatively common among wetland plants, but most of them revolve around ways that they transport oxygen from aerial portions of the plant through the plant itself and to the roots. And thus, you know, they're no longer relying on oxygen in the environment around the roots. They're actually facilitating the oxygen from the atmosphere down to the roots themselves. And different plant species have different capacities to do this and therefore have different tolerances to these anaerobic conditions and, and these hydrologies. So the hydrologies, we're gonna, as you're going to learn here, these hydrologies have a huge impact. These differences in hydrologies have huge, huge impacts on the resulting vegetation. 
So then you have plants that that vary greatly in 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 their in their structure and in how they grow. You have terrestrial plants, or I should say, emergent plants that are more much more terrestrial-like. Um, show some bulrush up in the top there that that um, are rooted and grow out of the water. Um, and, and even among trust, even among emergent plants, there's great variation in their tolerance for these anaerobic conditions and flooded conditions. Um, and you have those that require more flood duration and, and longer or deeper water, like the, the submerged aquatic there, the widgeon grass in the bottom left, and the, the, the rooted floating leaf there in the bottom right. So um, definitely adapted for different different hydrologies. And so there's a there's a few aspects of wetland hydrology that are really critical in understanding a wetland management understanding and how it relates to the, what's going to happen to the plant community. Um, one is uh, the duration of inundation, uh, the amount of time that a wetland basin has saturated conditions or standing water. This has a huge influence on the, the degree of, of oxygen or the anaerobicist or the degree of oxygen in, in the soil. In general, the, the longer the flood duration, uh, the less oxygen is available in the plant roots and, and fewer number of plant species can tolerate these conditions the, the longer and longer the flood duration. Uh, thus, if you think about that, that transitional habitat, that diagram I had in that first slide, the closer you get to that terrestrial system, the more species that will be able to tolerate those conditions. It's more like terrestrial. There's more, there's more oxygen available at the roots. Another one is depth of inundation. This is often correlated with duration of inundation. Usually deeper waters have longer flood durations, but even so, different species have different tolerances to flood depths as well. And many emergent plant species cannot tolerate very deep, deep flooding. Um, whereas species like the submerged aquatics that, that I showed you earlier need, need relative uh, deeper water to, to, to supply or to provide support to the plants. Also, areas where, where depths are too deep, you know, six foot or over, say, uh, photosynthetic activity uh, is, is pretty difficult to, to, to happen at that depth of water because of the penetration of sunlight. So a lot of those areas will remain unvegetated. The timing of inundation relates primarily to, to germination and, and influences uh, many, many of the environmental factors that, that stimulate seed germination. Um, across the growing season, and we'll get to that a little bit a little bit later in more detail. The frequency of inundation is, is kind of a double-edged sword, and it and how it influences plants. and And when the frequency of prolonged inundation is high, then it has a similar effect to the duration of inundation. Um, however, you know if the frequency resembles a a pulsating hydro period where there is kind of ample time that the basin is dewatered. And that this usually provides very productive situa situations where, where a lot of nutrients are coming in with the, with the pulses of, of water, and the, and the drying time allows decomposition and aerobic conditions to occur. So, so this sort of this sort of hydrology really results in, in high primary productivity. Flow patterns relates to the turnover of water through a wetland, and how open that wetland is to the, the different hydrologic pathways, bringing in, in water and taking water away from from the wetland. Uh, typically, the more open a wetland is, or the more flow it has, at least to a degree, um, the, the more plants can handle it because there's you know, dissolved oxygen coming into the, into the wetland. And also, related to this, certain pathways uh, provide more nutrients than other pathways. Overland flows and tides, for instance, if those are available to a wetland, uh, typically provide much more nutrient, uh, nutrients coming into the wetland and, 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 uh, for the plant, plant growth. So the pattern of, of water storage and movement in a wetland, which we've been, we've been terming hydrology here, is, is the main factor that dictates what plant species will be expressed in the wetland and from the seed bank and the density of plant growth and other factors and is by far the, probably the most important aspect of wetland ecology that a manager should have an under, understanding of. Um, even subtle changes in, in hydrology can result in large changes in vegetation community. And that is why wetlands are, are really so dynamic compared to terrestrial systems. In our, in our, a lot of our water, waterfowl and water bird research that we conduct, we're often classifying wetlands every time we're out on a site because it's just so dynamic and they change so readily. Much more different than, than terrestrial sites, as I said. So on this slide here, these photos, we see several different types of wetlands. 
uh, very different plant communities as a result of very different hydrologies. In the top left there, you see a wet meadow habitat type with saturated soils and very short durations. And, and most of the plants that grow in this are kind of facultative wetland plants, very much more terrestrial-like than, than, than a, uh, a deeper, a deeper uh, and longer hydro period that you find down, like in the very bottom photo, where you have more open water and submerged aquatics growing, or the middle one to the right there, where you have all the, the floating leaf plants. Those, have similar hydrologies, much deeper and much longer, long, longer flood durations. And then, then it ranges to the estuaries on the top right, which, which has high flow patterns, considerable nutrient inputs, and, and, and really high primary productivity, and, and uh, uh, definitely, definitely different than the, than the, other, um, the other wetland types. Generally, because wetlands experience prolonged drought and flooding, the, the, the seeds from wetland plants have evolved these adaptations to lie dormant in a substrate for long periods until suitable conditions reappear. And, and, and so seed banks can be extremely abundant and diverse. A seed bank we're referring to is the amount of viable seed in the substrate of a wetland at any given time. And because many wetland plant seeds have evolved to survive these long periods, and because various seeds have different environmental cues they're looking for in terms of germination, the plants growing in a wetland at any one time often are just a fraction of those in the, in the seed bank. So if you look at a wetland, you see the vegetation growing. Um, most of the time, it's probably just a fraction of the species available in that seed bank, and they just haven't been expressed yet because the, the required germination cues haven't been, haven't been uh, reached for those plants. So those, in, those environmental cues that, were, that, were, that stimulate seed germination include factors such as soil type and soil moisture and, and soil temperature, soil water salinity and, and day length. And, and these, these have huge impacts on most, most plant species, but also, also wetland plants. And soil type is something that we really can't manipulate easily. However, the other four factors we can by man, manipulating hydrology uh, during the growing season. So by, by doing those, we can, we can um, be quite selective in, in terms of what, what um, becomes expressed in the in the seed bank or in the in the wetland from the seed bank, and so wetland managers must understand ecology of seed banks because each management action that they just put into a seed bank, whatever you do, is going to select certain species and repress others. So requirements for establishment of propagules from from seed banks kind of fall into two categories. Uh, those species that can establish only when and where there is no standing water, these are primarily the emergent plant species. Um, and they usually establish on mud flats. And, and more aquatic species that, that can t establish when and where there is standing water. And this, this includes some of the submergent plants, the free floating plants, the rooted floating leaf plants, and so forth. This, this wetland here in this picture is experiencing a drawdown. And this is, this is in, in relatively early spring. And, and what I mean by a drawdown is it's being, it's being drained either naturally or, or, or uh, by someone doing it. Um, and as you can see here but from the arrows, you can see as soon after the substrate is exposed to, to sunlight and oxygen, you start seeing these emergent plants start to germinate. And, and like I said, you can see those under the red arrows. And so in regards to um, in regards to emergence, at least, these drying periods are, are extremely important for, for germination of plants. So when we think about the different communities, at least in regards to providing wildlife habitat, the emergent plant community is by far the, the central feature of wetlands, and, and they are typically the focus of our management and for, for, for many reasons. And, and I'm going to put this in kind of in, in wetland bird perspective, because that's what I deal with. But they provide a lot of different services to wetland birds. Uh, for instance, they provide structure and seclusion for nests. And not even for, not only for wetland birds, though, there's even a lot of terrestrial birds find refuge and protection in these emergent stands because, uh, because it's over water and, and, and less predators are going to access it. Uh, Emergent vegetation also provides escape cover during the broodering period. When young water birds are vulnerable to predators, it provides escape cover for adults during the wing molt when, when they are quite vulnerable because they're flightless for about five weeks um, after the breeding, breeding period. It provides 
can provide protective cover during inclement weather, and strong winds, and and so forth, and and even safe roost sites for for a lot of species. They 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 roost down there over water and can be very protective, just just as it is for nests. And they also provide food either directly from seeds or indirectly as a substrate for invertebrates. So very very important feature of wetlands. And it has been found. You look at some of the early work done on on some of the the prey marsh ecology. Um, at least with birds, the highest, the highest wetland bird diversity occurs when there's a ratio of about one to one between open water and emergent vegetation. And as we kind of covered or talked a little bit about in that previous slide, is most emergent plants require exposed substrates for seeds to germinate. So we often will, will conduct drawdowns during the growing season to promote their germination. And not only is the drying of a wetland uh, base and important for the establishment of these emergent plants, but also for things like decomposition and nutrient cycling in the wetlands. Another community, I should say the other community we kind of concentrate on is, is the submergent plant community. And often they're targeted for, for, for different management reasons. Uh, they serve as a direct source of food. Um, a, a lot of the pond weeds have, have have seeds that are that are um, preferred by waterfowl. Uh, widgeon grass, like in the picture, here, has droplets. Um, some species, widgeon and gadwall, eat vegetation of some of the some of the submerged aquatic vegetation. But almost more importantly, they serve they indirectly help by um, providing substrate or a habitat for aquatic invertebrates, which really become important for for waterfowl late in the winter, particularly female waterfowl that that need different nutrient requirements. For, for impending annual cycle events. Therefore, some of these plants, and particularly these submerged aquatics that, that may rank relatively poorly as a direct food source are really important in providing invertebrate habitat for, for a lot of these um, uh, waterfowl and, and water birds. And what we've, what we've found is it seems like the you know, leaf structure is pretty important and, and the density of plants are important and how much um, aquatic invertebrate community they'll be within. These thin leaves plants like the widgeon grass here seem to support a little higher diversity and abundance of invertebrates than some of the more broader leafed um, plants. And, and I mean, some of these species diversities and densities of macroinvertebrates in these wetlands can be astronomical. As you can imagine with, with um, these submerged aquatic plants that grow underwater, light penetration is, is pretty important as affected by turbidity. Um, which, which is important in affecting their growth. And, and even if other plants such as floating leaf plants like, like uh, lotus or some of the, some of the um, other floating leaf plants that, that can shade the water can cause problems with submerged aquatics as well. So getting on to some of the, some of the wetland management, um, you know, the management goal for a wetland Often depends on the status of the wetland, you know whether it's undisturbed, it's an undisturbed natural wetland, or a degraded wetland where we're doing some restoration, or a or a created wetland which that was created on a site that that previously had no wetland. And so, you know, on one extreme, if the wetland is is a created wetland, then there's typically considerable work to keep it functioning, um, particularly with hydrology, because it didn't have hydrology before. It wasn't a wetland. And so often, often there's, there's considerable active management um, in those types of wetlands. And the other extreme, you know, if, it's, if it's unnatural, or I'm sorry, an undisturbed natural wetland, the goal may be just to perpetuate existing functions. And often I find that w with a lot of these landowners that they, they almost feel a need to have to actively manage some of these wetlands when, when really nothing, nothing needs to be done you know, for it to function properly. Um, and this kind of gets back to the perception that, that wetlands should be wet all the time. Um, these wetlands with more ephemeral hydro periods, you know, they're not wet all the time, but they, they're typically very productive when they are flooded. And, and that, that long period of drying is the reason why they can be so productive. And they play, definitely play a, a role in the, in, the, in the ecosystem, particularly if you look at use of wetlands by spring migrating waterfowl. You know, they're, they're highly, you use these ephem real ephemeral wetlands um, after snow melt and so forth. These ephemeral wetlands kind of become available and they, they're, used, they're used a lot and pre preferentially. Um, this, this spring down here in South Texas, we've, it's been pretty wet. And I've got, a, I've got a wetland just south of my property that, that has, hasn't been wet for 
well, many years because of our drought, but probably eight years or so, and, and it flooded this year and very ephemeral hydrology to it. But as soon as it was inundated, there was, there was a, I mean, it's about a two acre wetland. There's probably about a 800 to 1,000 pintails that were on it immediately. And one night when, when they went to roost, I walked down just to look and see what they're foraging on it, and it was earthworms. I mean, it was just covered with all these earthworms that were flooded out of the soil, and they were, they were up suspended in the water column. So a very, very available, highly available food source, nutritious food source that, that, uh, that they were after that wouldn't have been there in a, in a more permanently flooded wetland. Um, so, so I guess the point being is that not all wetlands need to be managed, and, and we need to kind of understand their, their function in the landscape before we prescribe management activities. And we'll get down to that a little bit toward the end of the end of the talk or the webinar. Many techniques that we that we use to manage upland habitats are also used in wetlands, such as shredding, disking, burning, applying herbicides. And most often, we use these techniques to get rid of unwanted species. In wetlands, there's, there's, there's several species that can dominate, that are very aggressive, um, that, we, that, that can cause problems. We also use these techniques to set back succession and open up dense stand of emergent vegetation, maybe to get back to that one-to-one that -one ratio of emergent open water habitat. And we use them to remove biomass to allow sunlight to reach the soil for seed germination. If you look at kind of the bottom right down there with the, with the, with the bulrush, you can, you can imagine um, if you dewatered that wetland in those areas, there, there wouldn't be much sunlight, probably not much plant uh, seed germination in those areas because of the, because of the coverage of, of uh, plant residue. We also use levees and control structures to to manage hydrology. And obviously this can be an important, since hydrology, as, as we learned, is a major factor in influencing the, the development of, of wetland plant communities. In many instances, the effectiveness of, of the stuff we just talked about, the shredding, the disking, the burning, and the herbicides can be improved with proper control of hydrology following the treatment. So, for instance, if we, if we wanted to get rid of a, a stand of persistent emergent vegetation, we go in and shred it or disk it, you know, by go, coming in later and raising the water levels above the tops of the plants during the growing season can be effective in you know, inhibiting their growth and, and providing even more control. Oftentimes, the impoundments that we, that we manage uh, or create become less productive and less attractive to waterfowl as the vegetation community goes through these successful advance, advancements and, and, and get more mature. And thus, the, you know, mo most management plans at least for waterfowl and the wintering grounds, employ some form of water manipulation to keep setting back succession, get to these early successional plant species. So in terms of waterfowl, uh, the resource needs of waterfowl change throughout the year, and they're mainly driven by their needs during these, these specific annual cycle events. And so our management is directed towards those needs and differ throughout the annual cycle. Uh, we, we tend to have a very good understanding of, of the annual cycle needs of waterfowl. So really the, the where and the when types of decisions for management are, are not that difficult. We have, we have enough understanding of that. And I would say we're pretty good at timing specific management practices to coincide temporally and spatially with the annual cycle events of waterfowl. So the challenge reached to wetland managers is, is to understand wetland processes and, and why certain prescriptions work. There's a, a wide diversity of waterfowl that winter in Texas, um, and historically, if you look at, at wetland management, and even today, it's really focused on wintering waterfowl, and in particular dabbling ducks because of their abundance and their popularity as game species, and, and then really their preference to consume plant seeds during fall and winter. And which is which is easy to to produce by management practices. You know, in other words, we can we can pr be pretty successful at it if we if we know what we're doing. So the primary need of of waterfowl during fall and early winter, at least, is energy. Uh, these, these individuals have just you know spent time migrating from northern breeding areas. Um, burn up some of their reserves, migrating. They're, they're going through a pre-alternate molt, so they're, they're replacing feathers, which can be, um, can, can 
can use up some energy. So they search out sources of, of high energy foods to replenish their reserves and plant seeds are often the main high energy food for many species of waterfowl. Um, a common management practice for migrating and winter waterfowl is providing abundant seeds through what we call moist soil management. And this practice manipulates hydrology to promote emergent plant growth, primarily mud flat annuals, and these plants that produce lots of seeds. Uh, these annuals produce lots of seeds. So uh, the, the techniques vary regionally and from site to site based on differences in soil type, differences in the, the natural hydrology, or the ability of the, of the landowner to manipulate hydrology. So since our goal with moist soil management is to produce stands of annual plants, which like I said are these early successional species and produce lots of seed, much of our management relates to setting back succession. And it starts with a, with a spring drawdown or sometime during the growing season a drawdown. Um, where we we drain a portion or all the wetland depending on the type of vegetation and, and, and you know how we're how we're managing the, the basin. Um, if there's if there's woody plants or if, if some of these more perennial emergent plants take over, usually the drawdown period once the soil dries is a good time to get in there and do some mechanical treatments to set those back and, and either disc or shred. And the reason that we, we promote these early successional vegetation communities is that the energy at this stage of succession is, is really readily available. And it's, it's really not tied up in biomass like it is in later successional stages when you have a dominance of these large macrophytes. Also, the plants that are produced, these annuals, um, they're prolific seed bearers. And, and so unlike perennials, they must establish themselves each year. So they produce a lot of seeds just because of that life history trait. And we also found out that seeds produced by annual plants are typically more preferred by waterfowl than, than most of the perennial, uh, perennial plants. So having the ability to drain the wetland uh, through some sort of water control structure is extremely important to be able to time our, our drawdown and as well as manipulate the rate of the drawdown. Um, these drop board risers or flash board risers are, are relatively inexpensive water control structure and allow fairly precise control of water levels. You can see on the left hand side there though there, there's some boards in that one and it's functioning so you can get boards of different widths and, and actually have some pretty fine tuned ability to, to manage water levels. A lot of, a lot of landowners that, that want to manage moist soil don't really understand the, the or don't, don't have an idea, I guess, on the importance of being able to drain a wetland. So many of them that I've talked to that, that can pump water into it, but there's no way to drain a wetland. And, and a spring like this can be, can be pretty challenging to, to grow um, these mudflat annuals if, if we're getting all this rain and, and your basin keeps flooded you know, as, as much as it's going to be without the ability to, to drain. So moist soil management consists of, of, of a drawdown um, to drawing down the wetland sometime during the growing season to expose the substrate and, and stimulate these, these germination, um, these germination cues that these different seed bearing plants have. Most emergent plants, like we said, cannot germinate in standing water. Um, so depending on the species of plant you are, you're targeting, how hot the climate is. Down here we, we struggle a little bit with, with doing some of this because it gets so hot. It will determine how moist you'll need to, you know, to keep the soil during the drawdown. And a lot of times down here they're, they're drawing down in, even in August to, so the plant seeds will be ready not too early but ready for the duck season in November. And so you can imagine trying to keep some of these, these uh, small, small plants alive during, during August in South Texas. So once the plants mature and the seed heads are produced, preferably timed with the arrival of, of waterfowl of some sort, uh, we, we flood the basin in fall or winter to make the seeds available to waterfowl. And we usually flood at depths relatively shallow from anywhere from four to 18 inches, which is about optimal for most waterfowl species. So not, not, not very deep at all. Sometimes when we, when we do a really good job at moist soil management, we can get really thick stands of, of emergent vegetation like this stand of, of smartweed here. 
and, and sometimes they can be so thick that it's even too thick for waterfowl to, to land in. Um, so in some instances, we need to, to do some sort of mechanical treatment in portions of the stand to, to make it open up for, you know, allow access for the, for the ducks to come in. And this, this can often be done prior to flooding in the fall and winter or, or even, even when there's the, the basin is flooded if you have the right equipment. The thing that, that I recommend though here is, is the, you know, when you talk to game wardens in terms of the baiting issues, they all have different perceptions of, of what's legal and what's not. And most of them, if it's natural vegetation that you didn't plant that's growing there naturally, you can manipulate it. It's not, it's not an issue with baiting, but if you're planting something like millet, it becomes an agricultural crop, then things change. So I highly recommend visiting with your, your local game warden and asking them, you know, if, if what you're planning on doing is, is legal in terms of baiting or not, if you're going to be able to hunt over it. So. And unfortunately, with the baiting issues, it's it's often up to the interpretation of the game warden, and it's not a strict um, strict ruling. Another one common issue, I guess that I that I hear from from a lot of landowners is, is that they man, you know, we we flooded up our site, you know, these five basins, and flooded up our sites, you know, before before duck season, we were covered with ducks, but you know, by the middle of the season, they just weren't there anymore. And, and you know, this, this, this is an example of a landowner here that has, has, a, has five different basins. And, you know, in, in most instances, you know, they, they, do their, they do their homework and flood everything up and, and get all the seeds to germinate, I guess, before the, before the duck season and flood it, you know, before the, the ducks get there, right before the ducks get there so it's available. But what's happened is they, they were harboring so many ducks that they ate them out of house and home, and, and by the middle of the season there, were, there was no food left. In, in the wetland. So, you know, one thing I tell folks is, you know, don't flood them all at the same time. Do some staggered flooding in your in your impoundments, um, so you can you can keep food on the landscape, keep the groceries on the landscape throughout the throughout the duck season, and, and keep ducks in the area. <clears throat> another another I guess another. Thing to think about in some of these plants, like we, we just talked about smart weed earlier, so that picture of smart weed is in some of these plants like smart weed have have a lot of seeds available over a large vertical extent of the plant. Some of these plants grow pretty tall, and, and another way to keep food available is to is to flood up through the plant during the season. So early on, make make uh, make the lower parts of the plant available to ducks, and, and the upper parts won't be available. And then you can keep bringing that water level up throughout the the duck season. And so it, it exposes, it makes available different levels of the plant and, and, keeps, and keeps food on the landscape for you. One thing that, that I see with a lot of, of the waterfall management on the, on the Texas coast anyway is that many folks manage stri strictly for the hunting season. We, we conduct a lot of of over the years, a lot of waterfowl work where we're, we're chasing waterfowl in the air, you know, with telemetry and, and so forth. And being in the air gives you a really, really unique perspective of the landscape. And and what we've noticed is that in certain, particularly in certain parts of the coast where, where uh, landowners have multiple wetlands, these complexes of wetlands, they, they, they start dumping water, you know, at the, at the into the last week of duck season to concentrate the ducks and you know, have one big hurrah at the end, which which is really effective. But what's what's interesting is when when you're up in the air and you're tracking these birds, it's it's amazing how fast and how ex large extent that landscape can become dry from being optimally wet to be dry in in a short period of time. This is obviously more important and seems to be more important in dry years along the coast, but. But what we see with our with our telemetry data is that ducks are just totally confused, you know, to that that such that unnatural fast dewatering of the landscape, and they're making all kinds of of, of interesting movements. Unfortunately, what is happening is the waterfowl are losing habitat during probably the most important time of the winter. And if you look at the, kind of the the chronology down below, I ha I have a kind of a, uh, a, a 
bunch of dates there. It shows the extent of the kind of the non-breeding season. That red dash line is is typically the end of duck season there in the end of end of July. And if you see after that, there's there's a lot of stuff going on. Those ducks are here for another two months. You know, some of them are two months after after the season closes, and a, and a lot of important things going on, particularly with female waterfowl. Pre they're going through pre-basing molt, which is energy demanding. They're starting they're pairing. They're trying to keep pair bonds. They're getting ready to migrate and, and to initiate a clutch. And so they're trying to pack on reserves to increase their, their energy stores. And, and what we're finding with some of these species we call capital breeders that arrive on wintering grounds and rely on stored body reserves to, you know, to initiate um, nests and, and even clutches. Um, you know, they're deriving the energy to produce a clutch from, from late winter habitat and spring habitat. And so, so by dewatering this landscape, we're, you know, we're, we're maybe having a bigger effect on some of these some of these waterfowl populations and then we, we understand. Not only that, but we, we have a resident species, uh, the model duck there shown on the right side, that right photo, uh, that needs quality wetlands as, as brood habitat to success, successfully raise young. And unfortunately for the model duck, they haven't been doing real well over the last several decades on the, on the coast and, and primarily because of, of habitat loss from all the development and, and land use changes. So just some things to think about, you know, to maybe keep some of these, these wetlands on the landscape for, for a little longer periods of time. Although moist soil management is a very effective way to attract ducks, we know it works well for waterfowl. It's, it's not the only way that we can manage for waterfowl, and it really does not provide optimal habitat for a great diversity of wildlife as opposed to maybe some more diverse wetlands would. And we can promote a more diverse habitat by, by doing different things with our drawdowns, manipulating drawdowns, provide variation in these germination conditions, which typically results in a response from a larger diversity of plants. So this is a this is just kind of a quick diagram that I that I put together here and it's it's a looking down on a on a wetland basin. The the brown the brown line on the left is 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 a levee and the gray thing's a control structure. That's the so that wetland is draining to the left there. And so the colored par portion of this is the wetland basin. And is, if you if you kind of think about this as, as, as a stage drawdown where we're where we're either doing a really straw, uh, I'm sorry, a really slow drawdown, or um, one in stages, we can see that we can manipulate these these germination cues. So the dark green there, the early early part of the drawdown, you can imagine if that if that area that was dark green is exposed in early spring, you can you can imagine that that's, that's Temperatures are going to be cooler. The day lengths are going to be shorter, and so we're 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 manipulating these these germination cues and providing a a, a specific plant type to to germinate there. If we wait a little bit later and and do it later on in the spring in the in the light green area, then you can imagine if it's later on this in the spring, it's going to be warmer temperatures and longer day lengths and so forth. So you're going to be manipulating these like I said, these germination cues and as it goes to late, it's going to be hotter and so forth. And so, so you're, you're, you're stimulating germination from different plants to, to increase the diversity of your wetland. And then in the middle there, the blue part, that's a, that remains flooded. So in this, in this example, it's a partial drawdown. We didn't, we didn't draw down the entire basin, which we typically do with, with moist soil management. So we've, we've, We've left the water in there during the growing season, so maybe maybe to to uh, to save some of our submerged aquatic plants, you know, some of the more terrestrial plants to add more diversity. Or if we have fish uh, or invertebrates that we want to keep, you know, we we won't drain the whole the whole in, um, the whole wetland basin. So like I said, it adds adds another just a little bit more diversity. And, and a lot of times we do this in the spring. We will do a partial drawdown to even to concentrate fish and, and invertebrates to make it more efficient for these spring migratory um, shorebirds and wading birds to make it makes foraging much much more efficient when, when things are concentrated like that. So the last thing I, I kind of want to I want to discuss here is, is managing in, in wetland complexes. And and just give a little different way we think about even a single wetland on our property. Um, different wetlands will provide different ecological services and likely provide unique habitat for different species or, or maybe fulfill different annual cycle requirements for certain species. And if you 
look here at an example with a model duck. Um, they, they have very different habitat um, habitats they use during different parts of the annual cycle. If you look at pairing in you know late February and March and early April when when the ducks are courting and pairing, they're, they're usually you usually find them on these small isolated wetlands. They're trying to trying to remove themselves from from all these other ducks that are down here, they're getting ready to migrate back, and you'll find them in road ditches and these little dinky wetlands are no bigger than your office or little overflows from from windmills or whatever it might be, and they're just trying to be secluded and, and be able to pair and, and, and not be disturbed. And then during brood rearing and molting, you typically see them in these wetlands with a lot of emergent cover and, and, and good stands of, of both emergent and submergent vegetation because, the, like we talked about early, earlier, the emergent vegetation provides cover for the, the ducklings and the, and the molting adults because they're, they're vulnerable to depredation. And the submerged vegetation provides a lot of protein-rich um, invertebrates that, that's important. That's a macronutrient that's really important when they're growing or, or replacing feathers. And then in the wintertime, you see them move into the coast more. Or their their wetland, wetland choice is a little, more, a little more open, but they'll typically move more toward coastal areas that they really can't do during the broodering period because ducklings have a, have a tolerance of, to salinity. So if you, if you see the, the benefits of a diversity of, of, of wetlands, you can see that um, not only to fulfill requirements of, of different species, but, but also to fill varying requirements for a single species. In cases where a, a land manager has a complex of wetlands ac across, uh, you know, a relatively large landscapes, they are better able to provide, I guess, a diversity of wetland types to, to support a diversity of wildlife. And if that's your if that's your goal, then then these complexes and kind of managing and thinking about your wetlands in these complexes is, is, is much much more profitable. So understanding the, you know, how the wetlands you manage in the landscape is another thing a lot of people don't think about. And it'll improve your. It'll definitely improve your responses you get from wetland-dependent species. You know, for instance, if if you provide um, some kind of agricultural crop, say millet or something, in a landscape that's full of of agricultural crops, then it may be less valuable than providing a wetland that has natural vegetation and submerged aquatics to provide invertebrates, you know, invertebrates to complement these high-energy foods. So understanding, you know, what what is happening around your property can be can be extremely beneficial. And if you know any really effective refuge biologists, these folks are usually really on top of that. They have good relationships with their neighbors. They have a good understanding of what's going on around them. And they use that information to really help the, guide their management decisions on the refuge. Wetland complexes typically support more species than a single large wetland of the same size, although you know there are area dependent species that require large areas, but overall typically these these complexes are, are more productive because because you increase your habitat heterogeneity. And this is important because wetlands often satisfy um, wetland wildlife at least often satisfy their life history requirements using several different wetland types. So some kind of some final thoughts here, uh, a couple of slides here just to kind of, kind of think this through. Um, you know, an understanding of wetland processes and ecology of plant and animal species that you're targeting for your management is, is really important. And this will provide you with the, really the knowledge of, of why a specific management action works or didn't work and not really just the how, you know, how to do it. And, and you know, these how-to approaches is sort of like a hit or miss strategy that that will mostly be ineffective, except when you get lucky and, and you know hit the conditions just right one time or, or a few times. You know, for instance, having the knowledge to time your water level manipulations based on the phenology of the plants and animals you're targeting is more important than than strictly calendar dates. And so that, that that's kind of a you know, one of the big take-home messages is really understand the why things work, and that, I think that's missing a lot in, in, in when we when we manage wetlands. We can always implement management to enable you know a little bit better, I guess, a little bit more diversity to enable multiple species um, or to benefit, I guess, multiple species of wildlife. Um, typically, about providing more complex and diverse systems uh, that you're 
if you do that, your wetland typically is more complex and, and a little bit more resilient to unplanned disturbances as well. Um, if possible, think about the landscape. You know, think about how your wetland fits into the scheme of things, and I think that will help in terms of your wildlife use and provide you more of a holistic view of of, of your of your management. And also monitor your management activities um, and maintain detailed records. This is something a lot of people don't do, and this is you can really learn a lot about managing what works and what doesn't work, I guess, from taking notes, because all this stuff is so variable. You know, we talked about wetlands being so dynamic, and, and you go from one region to the other, even along the coast, and, and things are going to change um, drastically. And so by keeping these these detailed records of what you did and, and, and the, what the responses were, allow you to better understand why your management actions worked and, and help improve your habitat and, and wildlife responses to your management in the future. There's, there's, you know, just kind of sum up here. There's, there's se several, several entities in Texas that provide landowner assistance, whether it's through um, kind of some cost sharing ability or, or just technical guidance. You know, Ducks Unlimited, Parks and Wildlife, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and NRCS all have very capable folks. And, and depending on where you're at in the state, you know, your local guys are the ones there, the ones out there dealing with this, and they're the most knowledgeable for what works in your area. And and um, give you some good recommendations, and they can do things, you know, like if you're constructing a wetland, you know, they can do some some pretty high-tech engineering and really help you um, make your make your wetland project be successful. So with that, that's that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ballard. Uh, we had a few questions come in that I'll get to just one second. I would encourage anybody if you have any more questions as we go through these and answer these, uh, please post them up. We've still got some time to, to get to them. So the first question is how detrimental or beneficial are invasive species to wetland restoration projects? Well, yeah, I mean, they can be really detrimental. You get you get some of the salvinias or, um, you know, some even some of the, the purple loose stripe or something that takes over a wetland, They're, they can be very, very hard to control. Um, and a lot of it is, is you know, based on just having the ability to to control hydrology and and some of it's going to be you know just hard work somehow removing them physically, uh, part particularly things like the floating you know the free floating plants like Selvinia they can be really really hard to get rid of, and so yeah it kind of depends on the you know on the situation I guess, uh, but but um, you know there's there's successes uh, again you know talk to some of these folks. Uh, that, that deal with this in your area. You know, we have different different plants that provide, you know, different problems in different areas. So um, your local your local folks there are the are the ones that that have the experience in that. Okay. The next question: This gentleman says he's interested in managing for fishing purposes, usually deeper water, with waterfowl as a secondary benefit. Is there a way to balance the two? Oh yeah, yeah, you know, sure there is, and, and you know that's kind of that. That, that end there where we're talking about diversifying the habitat. I mean, you're not going to maybe pack them in and have the density of ducks in some of these deeper water habitats, but you're going to get a, you know, you need a wider diversity of ducks potentially. You can get more diving ducks in these deeper water habitats, and we have ducks that, you know, that that feed on on um, some of these submerged vegetation that the, they dive down and feed on the, in the benthic part, or they chase fish, um, you know, small bait fish and so forth, but. But you know, if you can if you can manage part of your wetland where some of it's shallow and, and get some of these more seed producing plants, you know, in the periphery, and, you know, sometimes that that is a drawback to fishing if you're fishing from the shoreline. So it kind of depends on on how you fish and how you see using it. If you can, you know, bring one end of your wetland that that you can you can um, have maybe more shallow water and bring in some dabbling ducks and produce some more food. Um, then, then yeah, definitely that's that's a beneficial. And, and I work with some landowners that that do that very successfully. Okay. The last question we have right now is: What type of connectivity might be needed between these small, more isolated wetlands in terms of management perspective? Okay. Um, I'm not not quite sure if I totally understand, but you know, birds. Most of our management, at least that I do, is for birds. Most people are interested in, in birds, and and the reason birds are so successful in wetlands and these dynamic systems is because they're highly mobile. You know, they they can fly, and so and so the distance between them 
um, isn't isn't quite as important as say like herpa fauna or some of the some of the wetland dependent mammals that need them that need them uh, you know a little bit closer. So it kind of depends on your depends on your objectives and what you're trying to trying to manage for. Um, I guess I'm not not sure I answered that totally <laughs> totally um, the way that they were looking for, but. Okay, and we still got a little bit of time. Uh, let's see, Rebecca, if you're still on, if you'd like to let me, elaborate a little bit. Uh, let me let me elaborate a little, just a little bit more. So, you know, part of it too is understanding what species you're targeting. And so, you know, if you're targeting, let, let's say, a, you know, a, um, just just to say waterfowl, we're targeting waterfowl, and so we know waterfowl need a protected roost site. And a lot of times, these roost sites are a lot different than foraging habitat. And so, you know, we we'll, we'll have to see kind of how, how a roost site fits into things. And, and in a lot of areas, if they don't have a roost site, you're not going to have many waterfowl in the area. You know, they're only going to fly so far. They're mobile, but they're only going to fly so far where it's energetically efficient for them. And so, you know, having a roost site, having different foraging opportunities. You know, they're, they're eating these seeds. Um, seed production is really important early on in the winter, in the, you know, in the fall and early winter. But later on, they're starting to, you know, they're starting to move to these more um, aquatic invertebrate diets, particularly the females. And the males are following the females. They pair during winter. Winter um, waterfowl are a little bit different that way. They pair during the winter, and, and the male follows the female back to the, to the breeding grounds. And so, so he's following her around, and she needs, you know, these high protein. Um, Sources and so you know areas that that aren't these maybe these shallowly flooded areas or maybe a little longer flood um, flooding duration that that has a lot of emergent vegetation you know close by where they can kind of capitalize on that and diversify the you know the, the macronutrients they're they're extracting from the environment so just you know thinking about the ecology of the species and and and, and kind of um, deciding what they need from from that. Okay, it looks like we had another one come in. Uh, a couple more. What is a good guide for identifying wetland plants? Okay, so uh, Stutz and Baker came out with one on the Gulf Coast. Um, that's probably the best one for Texas. It's a it's a little cumbersome in a way because it's it's divided up in flower color, but it's it's actually a really good really good resource um, for Texas because. It, it, it gives you a wildlife value for the plant as well as, as you know, other things. And so it's, it's a Parks and Wildlife publication. And I know they just, they just did a, a, a second printing of that here recently. I don't think it's in color. The original printing was in color, but you can get online and, and look for that, that wetland plant guide. And, and I'm pretty sure it was Charles Stutzenbaker was the, was the author of that. Okay, and the last question we have, how many plants can a wetland have before it detriments the fish from an oxygen standpoint? Well, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough one there. I mean, I mean, the, the oxygen in the water is going to be a little bit different than the, than the oxygen that they're sucking out of the, the substrate, you know, the plants are using the substrate. And a lot of times these these plants are actually increasing oxygen in the water, and so if you see, if you see a lot of these serious guys that are that are you know have fisheries, they have some sort of oxygenator in the water, um, you know that help oxygenate the water. Um, but in in terms of in terms of the you know I'm not a I'm not a fish expert and 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 uh, don't know if I can really answer that one to, to, to the level that they need to be talking to probably some fisheries guy I guess. Okay, um, let's see. We've had a project for five years in an old rice field in the process of draining it slowly. Would it be beneficial to dish strips or just leave it alone? Say, say that, say that, read that one more time. This gentleman has a project. Uh, it's been a five year project in an old rice field and they're slowly draining it down. Would it be beneficial to go in and dish, dish strips in it or just leave it alone and let it do its own thing? If they're if they're worried about um, you know getting plants to germinate, I would say it would be dependent on how much residual cover you have in the wetland. You know if it's if it's if the sub substrate's really covered with with debris, um, you know the problem with with flooded conditions with that loss of oxygen is that the the, the 
um, microorganism community changes and, and those anaerobic microorganisms are really inefficient at breaking down um, organic matter. And so, and so what we have, you know, one, one of the advantages of dewatering these wetlands is it allows air back in and you get these aerobic microorganisms that, that can, you know, that can break down um, detritus about 10 times faster. And so um, I, I guess it depends on how much residual cover you have covering the soil um, to determine you know what you need to do with that, and and I mean disking, disking probably won't hurt it by any means. Um, um, you know, it depends on your your kind of your seed bank. You've got a good you've got a good seed bank there. If you're going to plant it anyway, then then yeah, then then seed then disking isn't going to hurt. Shouldn't hurt anything. But mainly, I think the disking is just really, you know, to me, it's just getting that residual cover broken up and exposing that soil so it can be exposed to those environmental, those environmental cues that those plants need. We had one more question come in. We'll consider that our last one for time's sake. Uh, we, how would you moderate your wetland management response following a natural disaster such as a hurricane so that you don't, quote unquote, over respond to a natural process? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, if you look at the at the coastal marshes, you know, of the upper Texas coast, and and even in Louisiana, where when Katrina came in, and and even Ike came in, you know, there was high storm surges, and and just you know, at the time looked like it just decimated that that coastal marsh area. I mean, if you look at that marsh now, I mean, it's so much more vibrant. It it really it really did a lot of good by removing a lot of that organic that, that biomass, I guess, that plant biomass. And that's you know, that's what we do with a lot of these disturbances is it removes biomass. It's the main function of disturbances such as burning and you know and so forth. And and so yeah, it, it you know, it depends on the natural disaster and what it's done to the wetland and um you know if it's if it's yeah, and it's, that's a that's a tough one, you know, because it just with wetlands, there's so so many different op options that we could that I could come up with that would, you know, I'd provide different responses to. But, you know, I, I would I'd just assess it and see what happened, and and as long as your hydrology is, you know, still functioning, the plants will probably respond um, to most of these natural natural disturbances. It didn't take very long after after the hurricanes either for that that marsh to really rejuvenate. 